Thank you, Jim. Incredibly important to read those verses from Micah as we come back to God's word where you see the fulfillment at the end of no need for anything to do with war. War implements are turned into farm implements. People sit under their own fig tree. We don't really have fig trees. Maybe we have an apple tree in our part of the world. Maybe that's where that goes. But the picture is at the end, all will be well. It's all going to be okay. And this is where our hope is this morning. It inclines us and pulls us into the worship of Jesus who will set all things right. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. The clocks didn't change. You should all have loads of sleep. Goodness, let me give you a couple of announcements. So tonight we are um, continuing with Immerse. We're in Leviticus. If, if, you, if you've maybe missed a bit, it's not like school where you turn up this week and confess you didn't do last week's work. That's not how it works. Um, but on a wet winter afternoon, you could easily probably read the, this week's readings. It's much shorter than last year's readings, or you can listen to them. I've been listening to Leviticus in the car doesn't read well at some points, but it's God's shaking his head as well. Um, but great to be able to gather tonight and discuss it. Um, some of the conversations we're having are incredibly valuable. To really just sit with, with God's word and discuss it. Discuss what we have noticed for the first time or what we struggle with, but also what gives us confidence and hope. Um, so that's at half past six. You come a few minutes earlier. I do mean a few minutes earlier, not the Glengormley hour and a half earlier. Um, I've never met, been with people who come as early as possible to things. It's a wonderful thing, but there's a little bit of tea and coffee but at the start. Um, so come for that and then, and then just discuss what you've read this week. Um, there's a retiring offering um, in Mosaic for the Earl Hague charity this morning. Um, and so if you want to give towards that, please do. And uh, looking after those who have served um, their country um, in this part of the world. Friday night thing leaders are going to meet after the service, probably in the minister's room is probably the easiest way to do that for a short meeting to discuss um, the weeks ahead. Kirk sessions meeting at seven for prayer on Tuesday night and then half past seven as session. And the final thing, I think it's the final thing. Let me just confirm I haven't left anything out. Yes, the final thing at this stage is, so over the next number of weeks, we're going to run new members classes and some of you have been coming here for a long time and you're not members and we'll shortcut the conversation I'll have with you which is why should I become a member? I've been here for a long time, I'm involved here and I participate here. Membership in the Presbyterian Church in Ireland it only really actually has one form. So lots of people in Northern Ireland and in the province belong to the Presbyterian Church. There's only one membership. It's not like you're a National Trust member, you put the sticker in the car and you never go. That's not how it works. Um, in the Presbyterian Church, membership is you profess your faith is in Jesus and you publicly come into the church family. So your name is read or you come to the front. There'd be different ways for that to happen. But that, that's how membership happens. Just because you've been here for a long time doesn't necessarily mean you're a member. It does mean you're an important part of our church family. But in terms of the administration of church or having a say in church, because that's that's how this actually works. So if you're a member, then you get to have a say in decisions that we're making. And in the same way that if Crusaders Football Club was making a decision, they wouldn't ask me because I'm not a member. If you're not a member of church, you don't get to have a say in, in the decisions that we're making for the, for the season ahead. Okay. So if you're thinking, I don't need to do this, the reason I'm promoting this with you is if you would like to have a say in what happens in the future, you need to speak to me really today or next Sunday at the latest, or text me during the week with a few folks who are going to have a discussion about this and learn about what it is to be a church member. You may be thinking, I don't need this, but the church family needs it. They need you to participate in this. They need you to be involved, but to be able to have a say in this. Um, so if that is something you haven't done, please talk to me after the service and we'll get it a couple of times over the next number of weeks um, to be able to do, this is a really bad sell, communicant classes, because now you're thinking, I don't want to go to communicant. But these are the things you need to do to come into membership. You need to have a little bit of an explanation about what it means. Um, so that, that's the important part. And if you're thinking, I don't know if I'm a member, talk to Derek or myself and we'll check that. Um, but um, yeah, it's important that people who are, are members here get to have a say in our decisions about what, what we're doing in, in, in the future. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Oh, goodness me, it was that bad, was it? <laughs> I just lost you halfway through, no idea what he's talking about. You, I can't even promise you a badge or a key ring. You don't even get a, you just get to be a member and, and get to have a say in church life. Um, but that's a really important part um, for the rest of us that you get to have a say in this. Those are all of the announcements. I'm going to hand over to Derek. Thanks, Ruben. Boys and girls, do you want to come and join us at the front? Um, we've been learning our, a new song, Lost is Found. 
It tells the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Um, and what I love about those stories is that it reminds us that God doesn't give up. He never stops searching for us. 99 sheep weren't enough for him. Nine coins weren't enough. One son wasn't enough. God loves us so much and he wants us to belong to him. Hazel and Ruth, I think, are going to help with the actions. And we're going to stand as we sing. Let's praise God. Shepherds love them so But one got lost inside a deep ravine And didn't know how to get home The shepherd saw the one who strayed And couldn't rest till he could say What once was lost is found Raise up a joyful sound Come now and celebrate this one is home and safe. What once was lost is found. It's time to jump around. Let happiness abound for the lost is found. There were ten precious coins a lady kept. Until one day there were nine. She ran around the house and kept. To seek the one she couldn't find And when at last her coin appeared She wanted everyone to hear What once was lost is found Raise up a joyful sound Come now and celebrate This one is home and safe What once was lost is found It's time to jump I think that song's a grower. Because the first time I heard it, I just thought of Kenny Rogers and Hugo Duncan, and I couldn't get past it. 
And yet in Luke 15, we have this incredible declaration where the three stories are had. Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. And Jesus says, in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. We are the lost sheep. We are the lost coin. We are the lost son. And we have been found. That's what we sing about. That's what we declare. We were lost. It's not about others. It's about us. The declaration is God finds us where we are. And he rejoices. The angels rejoice over us being found. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray you'd break into our heads and hearts this morning. That we would have joy that, once, that what was once lost has been found. That, Father, for those of us who trust and believe and have given our lives to Jesus, that we would just find delight afresh and again in being found. That angels are rejoicing that we have been found. The heavens rejoice. If only that would leak in at our heads and our hearts today that we would rejoice afresh, that we would declare your faithfulness over us, your love for us, your care for us, your attention over us, but also the reality that in your work to bring about salvation, to bring about newness of life and bring us into your family, you will do whatever it takes. You search and find us. You do not give up over the lost sheep and are happy with the 99. With nine coins, you strip the house to find the lost coin. And as soon as the sun who walked away appears on the horizon, you run towards them. The great news that we declare today is you're a God who moves towards us. That you're the God who is heavily invested in this life. So much so that you sent Jesus. And so, Father, ignite our heads and our minds but our hearts and our personhood with the reality of who you are. That your love is unstoppable and never gives up. That even though we may feel lost, you find us. And Father, that we would know joy in our heads and our hearts today. We need more joy, Father. And you give us all of the reasons to have the greatest joy in the world in that we get to be yours. You are the maker of everything we see. All of creation was made by you. We were made by you. We are blessed by your kindness, your abundance, and your generosity. Father, we confess at the start of worship together that we often turn away from you, that we often don't live with joy, that we often live like we are still lost when we have been found. Father, forgive us. And as we turn back to you, help us to know your open arms. And Father, for some this morning, this is not the reality of their lives, Father. And we humbly pray that you would show them how much you love them. That we would know your love in substantial ways in our lives. And we would turn to come towards you like children to a loving parent. Thank you for your love for us, your care for us, your forgiveness for us. Your lack of holding our sins against us when we turn to you. But Father, we ask for your help to worship you, to praise your name, to bring all of our lives to you in prayer, and to hear your word for us today. Help us as we worship, Father. And the people of God said, amen, amen, amen. It's a good amen at the back. It's good to hear. It's good to hear. Boys and girls, we'd like to go out to glow. George has found a new button on the organ. Uh, 
Come next week and we'll see what he has for us. <laughs> Derek's going to continue to lead us in worship. It's great, George. Psalm 62, David reminds us that we have confidence in God because God is in control. God, and in knowing that God is in control allows us to wait patiently and to rest in him. David says, my soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress and I shall never be shaken. Let's stand together as we praise God. i 
I can't explain. This is mercy unreserved, through your sacrifice so great. I have peace that's undeserved, for the battle has been won, and I fear no shame or loss. Now the sting of death is gone, you're my solid rock and my salvation, my steadfast hope that won't be shaken, my soul will wait, my soul will wait. Continue to worship God in our offering, and as we do that, we're going to continue to sing and continue to worship God. Just read, read a little bit more from Psalm 62. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in Him at all times. O people, pour out your hearts to Him, for God is is our refuge. This is a song we've been learning. God is able. God is able. He will never fail. He is almighty God.
Prayers for others, I can't, are being led. I, sorry, Anna, I couldn't find you. I was, I always have a moment. Uh, Anna is going to come and lead us in our prayers for others. Thank you. Um, let us pray. Lord God, in this Remembrance Sunday, we remember those who have been gathered from the storm of war into the peace of your presence. May they have the same peace that calms our fears, bring justice to all peoples and establish harmony amongst the nations through Jesus Christ. We meet in your presence, O oh God. We commit ourselves to work um, with our faith towards reconciliation between the nations that all make people may together live in freedom, justice and peace. We remember with thanksgiving and sorrow all those whose lives in wars um, and conflict, past and present, have been given and taken away. Let us pray for all who suffer as a result of conflict and ask that God may give them peace. For the service men and women who have died in the violence of war, each one remembered by and known to God. For medical staff as they face the huge task of caring for those injured by the war, who have limited resources to care for these people. Please be with them and provide them with resources, support and care to deal with these situations. For all members of the armed forces who are in danger this day, remembering family, friends and all who pray for their safe return. For civilian women, men and children whose lives are disfigured by war or terror. Um, we pray for them. May God give peace for those who are mourning the loss of someone special. Be with them in their grief. For peacemakers and peacekeepers who keep, um, seek to keep this world safe and secure, um, please be with them. For those in leadership who seek peace, we ask you would be with them as they seek a resolution um, to many conflict and ask that there will be peace. God of truth and justice, we hold before you those whose names we will never know. Help us to lift our eyes above the turmoil of this broken world and give us the grace to pray for those who um, may wish to harm us. As we honour the past, we put our faith in the future as you are the source and life and hope now and forevermore. Amen. Thanks, Anna. Thank you very much. We're going to continue in um, working our way through Luke, um, and so we're in Luke 12 this morning, um, and reading the first, first, the first 11 verses of Luke 12. I don't know why that got difficult in my head, but it did. Uh, there's not a tongue twister in there. Uh, so let's read Luke, Luke 12 together. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, 
Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the air in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid, you're worth more than many sparrows. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But who, whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. And this ends our reading for this morning. So we have really the last time I was speaking, and this time a little subsection in Jesus' life where he is incredibly direct. These are uncomfortable words. But if we're to take Jesus' life seriously, we should look at everything that makes it up. But quite simply, at the start of this, people are trampling on one another to get to Jesus. Can you just imagine how that would go? There's a crowd of thousands, and they're so desperate to get to the person in the middle, they are standing on other people who are trying to get to the same thing. The hunger and the desire to hear the words of Jesus. A human stampede to get to him. Even before I got into this this week, I was considering that because we have that ability and that accessibility to hear directly from him. Not just what he said on this particular day in his life that we have, that we have recorded in Luke 12, but we have the four gospel accounts of Jesus speaking his words, his actions. And then further than that, we have the perspective on that of all of his life and the life of the church. And so the simple question would be, are you hungry to hear the Son of God, to hear Jesus speaking words of life? Because the people in the story, are, I, I'm not encouraging that as a church project, we should have a race where you're standing on other people in order to get into the building. But the hunger is such for people to get to him that it's, it isn't that after you. No, no. This isn't a, the quintessential English queue. The English are famous all over the world for queuing for long periods of time. And if you go to other parts of the world, there's no such thing as a queue. If you can get on the bus, you're on. It doesn't matter if you arrive first or last. This is a stampede of people standing on one another because they're so hungry to get to Jesus. And the thing to just be honest about is we have access to the gospel accounts of Jesus to all of his life, not just this, what he was saying on this morning or afternoon. And for reflection in our own lives is, do we have any hunger to hear from him? That's not even my main focus this week. As Jesus continues in this declaration of woes, and he's speaking now, not to the crowd, but just to the disciples who are around him, those closest to him, and he says, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. Hypocrisy. Yeast is important if you bake. Now, I will stay in my lane. My baking ability is only carrot cake. I don't know how other cakes work. I know one recipe. I follow the recipe. And so far, it has worked most times. Outside of that, I don't know what I'm doing. But in our modern world, yeast, baking soda, baking powder, or buttermilk, you need a raising agent. There's men here who are learning. Sorry to be, that's very, not of its time, but some of you have never baked Ormo supply or some blessed, and that's it. But you need a raising agent, you work it through the flour and the dough, you work it through the mixture, and if it works through the mixture correct, correctly, then under heat in the oven, the little pockets of air that have grown inside the dough expand, and you get, as Paul Hollywood would say, a lovely crumb. Or you get that, that thing the whole way through, all of that stuff. We're half familiar, some of you. So you get, but the yeast has to work its way through. If you don't mix it right, half of it will rise or it won't rise or it will fall in the middle and all of those things. The key is, is that this yeast works its way through everything. Just works its way through. Following the way of the Pharisees is to follow the way of hypocrisy. 
Jesus is warning the people, his disciples, as they hear this, that the, the way that Pharisees live can work its way through and be really damaging to everyone's life. From a couple of weeks ago, I was giving you some information on the Pharisees. I would almost, you know, I will call them the Holy Jews of Judaism. That's what they are. So they have unpacked the first five books of the Bible into 613 laws. And because they want to be obedient to God, they live their life very strictly in adherence to 613 laws. This is far more than the Ten Commandments. Some of you are struggling to keep the Ten Commandments on a given week. These guys had 613. Within a subset of the Pharisees and experts of the law, they had unpacked the 613 into 6,000 laws. Now, they were some, some crack at a party. <laughs> living their life under the guise of six. Could you imagine living your life with an awareness of 6,000 laws about everything that you do? They put muslin over the top of their jugs because a fly might fly in. And if you were to accidentally ingest a microscopic fly, you would be unclean. So it impacted all areas of their life, you're thinking that these guys were not fun. They, but because they wanted to keep God's law, and that was at the heart of this, but over time what had actually happened was they started to unpack all these other traditions around it and all these other rules around it that they were trying to keep that you're thinking, well, maybe if you're in the Middle East and it's really hot and you ingest the odd... If you've, if you've ever had the midges at a picnic, these guys are trying to control that. Only they're in the Middle East when the place is covered. This is how they apply this, and they live their life in service of these rules. And at some point in that process, what they were no longer talking about was God. They were talking about keeping the rules. That's what became most important. But the challenge was within that, they weren't able to keep all of the rules, and they were judging others. And they, they weren't on the inside as they were on the outside. Because Jesus calls them out, telling them, as we looked at the previous week, you neglect, this is of the Pharisees who kept the 600 laws, some of which kept 6,000. You neglect justice and the love of God and being generous to the poor. So you have people who are working so hard to keep all of the rules, and yet when it comes to the big stuff, they're, not, they're nowhere. And Jesus is naming this as the key stuff. Jesus is going, you neglect justice in the world that you live in. You don't love God. And also, you're not generous to the poor. This group say they're following God's law, but in fact, they're missing it. Their inside life and their outside life don't match. They're managing the outside actions all the time, but they're not centering their life on relationship with the living God. This is not Jesus meek and mild. This is not he's just a tiny baby and he's harmless to everybody. This is Jesus being incredibly upfront about the reality of what it is to be a hypocrite in the world. Don't act one way on the outside and one way on the inside. One of the definitions of hypocrisy is actor, which I find quite helpful. So if you're a hypocrite, you're an actor. You pretend one thing, but you, you've probably, you've all the, I don't need to unpack hypocrisy. You have experienced people who are hypocrites in your life. And at some point in your life, you have been the hypocrite. That would be fair. At some point in your life, you said something on the outside and it didn't fit with your inside. But you were in the room that you were in, it was just what needed to happen for a quiet life. That's true. It's true in my life. It has to be true in yours if you've lived for any length of time. And then we come, you think that was uncomfortable? Jesus gets into some of his most uncomfortable words, I think. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I get a picture of an outdoor cinema and you would all turn up and on the screen would be what somebody had done that week or what somebody had seen that week. Everything being made known. Everything being seen. I think, pretty awkward. Can you imagine this just for your last week? You don't need to think of your lowest moment in your life or the moment that comes to mind where you think, oh goodness, I really blew that. Just think of your last week. And if... We had the technology that everything that you put your eyes on this week was on the screen at an outdoor cinema. I don't think they'd serve popcorn. There's a guy there serving popcorn in the photograph. I don't think that'd be popcorn type entertainment. But what appeared on the screen was everything your eye had seen that week, but the audio was what you really thought on the inside of everything that you'd seen that week. 
I got fair, I'm going to be honest, I'm fairly uncomfortable with that. And I've had a couple of days to think about it before today. Everything that you thought when something happened. So at some point this week, maybe you were teasing somebody, but you teased them on the inside because you learned you can't say that out loud. So it's not even the stuff that you said that you apologized for, it's the things on the inside. Because what Jesus describes here, what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms, it's like when you're in the house and somebody says something and you go, hang on, we'll just close the kitchen door before we say this because I don't want the kids to hear what we're talking about. And what Jesus is saying is, even those whispers where you say something in your most unkind moment and you know it, but you're just trying to get it out there, will be made known. That's uncomfortable. It's, if ever there was a, a, an impetus or an invite to go, maybe I need to have a bit of reflection in my life and think about how I'm spending my time, I would say that's a pretty good one. It'll all come out. Jesus brings everything into the light. The warning here actually isn't about bad behavior. It's about hypocrisy. It's the bit where you're not being congruent about what's actually happening in your life and pretending it's something else on the outside. That's actually what Jesus is working at, that the yeast of the Pharisees is, oh, no, no, we're on our best behavior publicly, but actually this is what's happening in my heart, or this is what I really think in my head. That's what Jesus is actually swinging for. He's not just going... You need to have a better moral life. That's not his point in this. His point is to do with hypocrisy. To do with, do you act one way on the outside, but act a different way on the inside? The hypocrisy is the danger your inside life and your outside life should match. They should mirror. We live in a part of the world that still has, it, it, it's, it's ending in many degrees, but an idea of this good living tracking through it. And good living, if you're not familiar with it, is a measure of, I don't do these visible things. And it depends, because... What's hard about the good living rules is they change depending on where you are in the country. So if I was in uh, the Northwest, I would describe this differently. And if I'm in South Down, they have a different set, which just adds confusion to the good living rules as you move around. But you have smoking, drinking, gambling, swearing, and then add in others depending, and that's how it works. So you have this idea of this is how things are meant to look on the outside, and you will be judged by the community, by people around you, based on how you look on the outside. And maybe at that point, there's more similarities with the world of the Pharisees than we might think. But Jesus moves right into this. Don't be afraid of those who can kill the body and after that can do no more. I'll be honest, we have a few family rules. Our first family rule is don't die. And it's amazing as parents how many things you can rule out just with the basic bit of that might kill you. Please don't do it. It's a silly family rule. It's rule number one of our family. You probably live your life mostly avoiding death as much as you can. You've probably learned to look both ways crossing the road. Are you with me? You look left and right? Although the younger generation of school children, I think, are playing a game of dare because they don't look anymore. But what Jesus describes is, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body and after that can't do anything else. We should fear the one who has authority to throw you into hell. It's incredibly direct language. There are consequences to how we live, but there is more to living than just this life. We were all made for eternity. And that should change how we live and what we give attention to. The Pharisees and the people who lived in the Pharisee way lived in a fear of not being seen to do the right thing. This was all there was, and the most important thing was how you were perceived to live in the here and now. That was value number one. But Jesus takes all of this so much deeper than that. And he's reorientating you, if you're a follower of Jesus, to go, you should consider God over people. That's easy for me to say. On a Sunday, you'd almost expect that. But often in our heads and in our hearts and in our lives, we are all impacted by the opinions of other people. Whether it's family or friends or people that you give some element of importance to and they dictate, you don't want to displease them, you don't want to make that, you want to look good. The danger of that is you begin to act like somebody else, in which case you become an actor in your own life. You're pretending to be something in a certain room. I wonder in your life, have you ever had this said to you? Or if you said this to somebody else, don't make a show of me. That might sum up my childhood years. It might sum up yours. You can't go out like that, what will people say? Oh, some of you had a great teenage years. You chuckled involuntarily about that. Make a show of me. Don't go out like that. What will other people say about, about how you look? 
or you've brought shame on the family. You often see that in, in soap operas, almost the worst crime in the British family soap operas, because it's like the Sugdens, or you have the East Enders families, like the Mitchells moving through, and you have these things. And one of the worst is to go, you brought shame on the family. That's familiar for you. That's all based on what something looks like for other people to be the judge. Maybe you've said that at some point in your life. Maybe you've heard it. Maybe you've said it. Other people's opinions can control our lives. And you might say to me, but people are meant to see a Christian's example. They're meant to see you doing good. They're meant to see you model this. Yes and no. So I think I've shared this before. I once had a lady come to me. And she meant incredibly well by saying this, but she went, you're our moral teacher and you're meant to model how to live. And in the moment, I kept my tongue in my head because I was on my best behavior, but I could think that is the worst idea I've heard in a long time. Because I'm not the model. That's a disastrous idea. For me to be the model on most things would be a disaster. But it also applies, you're not the model if you're a Christian. The model of being a Christian is... See the one that I'm following? Follow him. If I'm the model, we're all in trouble. Hopefully, on a good day, maybe even on a bad day, in my life what you see is our minister is trying to follow Jesus. That's what he's trying to do, and he's devoting his time to trying to get the church family in Glengormley also to follow Jesus. If we start following each other, we've just become a crazy social club. We've elected somebody else to be in charge. If we're following each other or even following the opinions of each other, actually what happens is at some other level, other norms become what's most important. What people should see in our lives is that person's really endeavoring to follow Jesus. That is what's most important in their life. That's the essence of Christianity. We are followers of Jesus. It's in the name. Christian, it's in the name, Christ. He's the one we follow. And so our witness is we are following Jesus. Because what we want to become true in other people's life is that they would become followers of Jesus. If, we're, if, if the grand scheme at the end of our lives is other people should follow us, that's a recipe for absolute disaster for us and for those that we love. The aim and, and the witness of our lives is that We model what it is to follow Jesus in the shape that you're in, in the form that you were created and made. And what other people say is, oh, goodness, they're a bit mad sometimes. But you know something? They are trying to follow Jesus. Some of the holiest people I have known were Christians who just occupied their shape in the world. But it was really obvious that all the time, all they were trying to do was follow Jesus. Jesus was what you realized in their life was most important. As Jesus describes this, if you want the antidote to hypocrisy, to acting out what other people think, what you make as the priority in your life across all of your life is what it is to follow Jesus. But then we come to incredible news because Jesus is fairly straight with the first two parts of this. Sparrows. Apparently you can buy sparrows five for two pennies. Do you remember the half P coin? Put your hand up if you remember the half P coin. And nudge the person beside you if they haven't put their hand up because they're, they're telling fibs. Lily doesn't know, and I tried to explain to her, and I sounded so old because you used to be able to get two chews for a penny. I'm not even sure you can get two chews for 5p now, which was a shilling, and now we're going to move into a whole different territory. It just depends how old you are, how much money sweets you get for your pocket money. But Jesus says you can buy five sparrows for 2p, they're almost worthless. And yet what Jesus says is that even these tiny little sparrows that seem worthless are not. Not one of the sparrows is forgotten by God. God remembers even the sparrows. God thinks and considers about even a tiny sparrow. This is incredible. This is where the model of following Jesus begins to come out because what we believe is the God that we worship and the God that we love cares about even the tiny, tiny birds in your garden. Jesus says, clearly he says, you're worth more than sparrows. You're worth more than many sparrows. And then Jesus says, God numbers the hair in your heads. It's too easy to do a whole ball drift for a few minutes. We're not going to do that. 
You've got 145,000 hairs on your head if you're blonde, and about 90,000 if you're a redhead. Theologians sometimes get stuck on things that I don't think was the point of Jesus, what Jesus was describing. You have lots of hair on your head. And God knows the number of them. The God that we worship today is the God of the whole universe, but the God that remembers even the tiny sparrows and the God that even knows how many hairs are on your head. And this is Jesus speaking. Because what Jesus says, you don't need to be afraid because God has you. God has you. As Derek read today from Psalm 62, it's like he has, I think the picture Derek at times has a sledgehammer and he's just trying to get you to see things. And when Helen's leading, it's the same. It's that space of God is our strength. God is our stronghold. God is dependable. God knows even the hair on your head. He knows your life in such detail. He knows things about you that you don't even know. And he cares about you and remembers you and considers you. Jesus doesn't want us to be afraid. I think that's incredibly significant because if your life is based on what other people think, if you're a hypocrite and you're worried about what other people think all the time, you need somebody to tell you not to be afraid. You need somebody to tell you you don't need to be afraid because somebody knows you even more deeply than what you project on the outside. What Jesus then describes this idea of fearing God. The fear of God is, is what it says. But our idea of fear is often waylaid or has been influenced by horror and by thrillers and the movie world. And so fear becomes this idea of dread. It's more of a wondering reverence. Holding God in awe and not in the American awesome type, not that, but deep awe. Awe of who he is because he is magnificent. And so when the Bible describes fear of God, it's not a God's coming. It's a, he is so majestic and magnificent that we can just wonder at his awesomeness. That is what the Bible means by fear of God. And in your life, if rather than fearing your neighbor or your boss and work, or maybe it's a family member or somebody in your past, who you have reverence for isn't other people, but it's God. It changes how you live in your life. If if you have an audience of one in your life, if your audience is God above all else, that changes how you live. And if you are giving God his place, then actually you don't need to be afraid about other people. And then something that I think is just marvelous, and I probably will not even be able to communicate this well because I think it's so marvelous I can't really articulate it well. It says, if you acknowledge Jesus before others, doesn't say you need to explain all of your faith, you need to go and read all your theology. It just says if you acknowledge Jesus, if what's clear in your life is you're trying to follow Jesus, Jesus in his full glory will acknowledge you before the angels of God. Now that's a day out. Not a remarkable moment that if in your life what you're doing is acknowledging Jesus and just acknowledging him. So maybe somebody tomorrow says, what are you doing? Oh, I go to church because I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, you're doing is being honest about who you follow. But in an eternal aspect over life, you imagine the idea of Jesus before the heavenly host going, hey, Peter, thanks very much. Hi, you see. Hi, Elaine. Just imagine the space of that. Just imagine. Hi, Sam. Thanks. In the heavenly host... It's a remarkable idea. Jesus will acknowledge you when Jesus is in his full glory before the angels of God and Jesus has given you a hi, hiya. You spoke for me. You acknowledged me in your life, in the world where I'd placed you to be. Don't know what I'm doing. Great. I move this as if this helps. I have no idea if it does. Does it? Can you just imagine this to hold your attention for a minute? The idea of that. That Jesus will publicly acknowledge you if you acknowledge him. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, that if you, in your humble ways, doesn't say you can give a full account of everything that you believe and explain it, in a, just says acknowledge him. If in your life that happens, that at the end, in eternity, Jesus in his full glory will acknowledge you. And it's acknowledge Jesus. It's not acknowledging good living. It's not acknowledging following rules. It's not acknowledging that you're a Presbyterian. 
It's acknowledging Jesus. It refines all of this. It strips out all of the other pharisaical stuff that we might add in. We might add in for good reasons, but we add stuff in. It's acknowledging Jesus. The central core foundation in this is Jesus. And Jesus goes further with his followers. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, whoever speaks against Jesus, will be forgiven. So if you even speak against Jesus, Jesus' forgiveness is such that he can hold all of this. But then Jesus has this bit that people have wondered about for a long time. If you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, you will not be forgiven. What does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit moves into you. If you're a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit moves into your life and dwells in you. And what Jesus is saying is, don't speak evil about the work of God in your life. Don't deny it. Don't put it down. A few weeks ago, we looked at the moment where Jesus was healing people and he was accused of doing the work in the power of Satan. Crediting the mighty work of God in your life to Satan is what is unforgivable. At times you make it into other things. It's quite a precise thing, what Jesus is saying here. Don't take the good work of God in your life and ascribe it to Satan. What it really is saying is, you can even blaspheme Jesus and that is forgivable, but don't demean the work of God in your life. Consciously rejecting the witness of the Spirit of God and giving credit to Satan, that is setting yourself against God. That's the thing that's unforgivable. Even in your worst day, if you get something completely wrong and you move against Jesus, Jesus says here, he forgives you. But Jesus, what the invitation of this passage, I think, is where Jesus invites us to be acknowledged by him whenever we're in full glory and full relationship with him. Jesus knows we're flaky. Jesus knows you're going to get it wrong. Jesus knows at times you'll say the wrong thing and, even, and maybe even deny him or ascribe him badly. And Jesus says himself, that's forgivable. But whenever you move one step further and you start to speak against the work of God and you begin to actively say, that's quite a precise thing that Jesus is speaking about. That's where you're in dangerous ground. I think this passage, if you're a follower of Jesus, gives us the invitation to live this life everywhere you go, being solidly yourself on the inside and the outside in every place you are. With no pretense, no need to be worried or be anxious because Jesus doesn't want you to be afraid. As Jesus describes it, the worst they can do is kill you. I'll be honest, I'm still a bit nervous about that. But Jesus pulls a horizon right out. The worst that can happen probably in our part of the world. If I was preaching this in China this morning, it would be a very different space, or North Korea. But in Newton Abbey in County Antrim, awkward silence. Somebody might not like it. Somebody might mm, give, you the, give, you the, give you the face. Mm, we're having this conversation. You're not going to jail for it. You're not going to lose your job over it. It's just a space where you're acknowledging what it is that you believe. But even as Jesus describes it, the worst they can do, can, can, can do is kill you. But there is a life after this one, and it's all going to be okay. Where God will not and does not forget you, because you're precious and valuable to him. That your life matters. And if your outside is as you are on the inside, and you live in that truth, that Jesus will acknowledge you before the angels of God, I think that is just the most remarkable thing. What an incredible invitation that Jesus gives us. To live on the inside as we are on the outside. And as we do that, there is eternal ramifications for us, and that Jesus will acknowledge us in the heavenly realms. It makes me think back to sometimes in conversations where I didn't say something, and I'm thinking, I missed the invitation of Jesus. Where he invites us to be acknowledged by him in fullness in front of the angels. I think living this life in the wondering reverence of God in all of this life is a liberating thing. Jesus doesn't want us to pretend. He doesn't want you to act in your life. He doesn't want you to pretend to be somebody else. He invites us into this space where we are free, where we are liberated, where we actually are just fully who we are, where he's placed us to be. The other is to live a life where the outside way and the inside way don't fit. You live your life in the fear of being found out. But as Jesus uncomfortably describes, in the end, it's all coming out anyway. It's all coming into the light. Living this life in fear of those who aren't for you and allowing them to dictate your life is not what Jesus' plan is for your life. Living this life thinking you're on your own and it's all on you is not what Jesus wants for you. That's not what's described in Luke 12. One of these ways I think is compelling and attractive and the other sounds deeply exhausting to me. And I say that as somebody who lived in fear of other people's opinions for a really long time. 
It's exhausting. I used to come home from meetings in church and I'd go, I didn't say anything. And Glenda would go, why didn't you say something? I'd go, oh, I was just frightened. I was frightened they wouldn't like me. And that's in church. That's in the church family. Oh, I didn't speak up. I didn't say, hey, why? Oh, I just, I, I, did, I didn't feel confident. And you act out what you think other people want. When in fact, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And the church family needs you. Your family needs you. Your street needs you. Where God has placed you to be needs you in the shape that you are in. Doesn't need an actor. Doesn't need an imposter. Doesn't need somebody trying to be somebody else. I think the invitation of this is strongly to live as who God made us to be. And not to pretend. And not to act. But just to be who we're made to be. Because Jesus loves us. Let me pray for us. Jesus, your perspective on our lives is so much bigger than this life that we're in. Father, for some of us, we have lived lives of anxiety and worry. We live by the unspoken code of don't make a show of ourselves. Don't show up other people. Don't be seen to be bad in any sense based on other people's ideas. And yet, Father, we don't set out to become Pharisees or to become actors or people who live lives of hypocrisy, but we end up doing that because we're not being who we are. Father, we thank you for the words of Jesus here that give us the invitation to be the same on the inside, to be the same on the outside as we are on the inside. That what we really model is who we're following, not our strength, but your strength. That you are the strong one. That you're the one who holds us together. That's what we model. We model our need of Jesus. That our lives are devoted to Jesus. Father, for some of us, this is deeply terrifying. Father, give us confidence in you. Even as we begin to describe who it is we're following with our lives and the places you've placed us to be. Give us confidence that comes not in our will, but in yours, because... In you, this is all going to be okay. And it's actually going to be so much more than okay. Because even as Jesus describes this, you will acknowledge us in front of the angels. That is an incredible picture. Father, give us strength because our strength is in you. Come Holy Spirit, come Lord Jesus. And the people of God said, Amen, Amen. Derek. Creations
birth, giving life to all that God has made. Show your power once again on earth, cause your church to hunger for your Cause your church to hunger for your ways. What a great line in this. Can I thank Hubert and David and Jim and Andy for enabling us to have an act of remembrance at the start of the service, but also George and the band. And if you could pick up your kids from Glow Friday Night Thing Leaders in about five minutes, if we can meet um, in the minister's room, that would be great. Just enough time for me to get a cup of coffee. And if you'd like to turn to the person beside you and bless them with the grace, please do. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.